Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley, Taylor, James and our very special guest are one of our favourite geographers in the whole world, Mr P. Hi. So as always we're wearing togas, we're drinking wine and eating olives and today we're going to look at the meeting between Mark Antony and Cleopatra in Tarsus in 41 BC. But before we carry on, clearly Mr P got the memo about fancy dress, hearing it's about Egyptians, he's come wrapped in loo roll as some kind of Egyptian mummy. Is this um this where the stockpile in loo roll came from, Mr P? Yeah, I went Costco. <laughs> <laughs> is this the, the good loo roll or is this the emergency budget loo roll? Only Andrex and me. We're gonna roll him down the stairs afterwards and see if it tears. <laughs> it's already tearing. <laughs> so anyway, let's carry on. So previously, the last time we were talking about Cleopatra, she was left with the dilemma of who in the new triumvirate would best serve her needs. <coughs> her needs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously, it wasn't going to be Lepidus. Why? What's, who is he? It doesn't matter. No, Mr. Beige. Yeah, but he's got a cool name. <laughs> it, he does sound cool. He's not though. No, <laughs> no, not at all. No one cares about Lepidus. Let's move on. <laughs> so there was two remaining. So Mark Antony and Octavia. Mark Antony provided her with the best opportunity for immediate support, and also she already kind of knew him she'd met him through caesar so there was that kind of affiliation and familiarity that was already there so wheels slowly start setting in motion to create a meeting between mark anthony and cleopatra but these same wheels however also start driving a massive wedge between the two significant triumvirs anthony and octavian not lepidus so, following the death of Caesar, it's easy to portray Cleopatra as simply running off back to Egypt where she can just pick her next suitor. But in reality, she's a bit more badass than that. She often sends Egyptian troops to both Antony and Octavian to help fight Caesar's assassins, particularly at the two battles of Philippi in Macedonia. She even captains a squadron of warships that she's setting off to meet the Triumvirs for another military action, but has to turn back because of bad weather. Either way, she's making herself invaluable to Rome and whoever is going to be the next ruler. And another thing, she also managed to oversee years of relative stability and prosperity in Egypt. So her popularity is increasing at home. There's another kind of issue that's brewing in Rome, which is all about Caesar's will that he's left and who's going to get the money from that. So he's promised money to the plebs, which Octavian wants to dish out to make himself look great. Um, Anthony has already spent most of that money on himself. Yeah. So this, <laughs> what a lot. Well, yeah, so there's already a spanner that's starting to be thrown into the works in their relationship. It's a bit harsh calling Mark Anthony a spanner. He <laughs> was a whole bag last week, now he's a spanner. Well, I'm detecting some bias against Mark Anthony here, eh, Taylor. Not, not at all. I think he's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> It'll make me laugh. Mark Anthony is such a boring name. What's wrong with that? Well, it would have been Marcus Antonius. Does that float your boat a bit more, Mr P? Yeah, yeah, it's better, yeah. There we go. It does sound a bit pedestrian compared to Augustus and Lepidus. <laughs> yeah, Lepidus. Anyway, whilst, <laughs> whilst no one's caring about Lepidus, whilst Octavian's organising Rome and the West, Antony's planning a series of what he thinks are going to be quite potentially lucrative military campaigns in the East. The East is wealthy if he rocks up and pillages them, that's more money for him to spend. Solve his problems. Yeah. He also hopes it'll boost his position, certainly as a lead triumvir, and definitely re-engage that relationship with the army that he's previously had. When in doubt, start a war. That seems to be his, his way of doing things. He's learned from Caesar, hasn't he? Yeah. So he spends a lot of 42 BC in Athens, basically living it up, so whoop whoop! <laughs> so he's partying, presenting himself as the living Bacchus, or Dionysus, so he's basically getting drunk, having orgies, doing whatever else he used to do with anything that moved, we've already said that. To be fair, Dionysus is the god of wine, fertility and ecstatic dancing, so... What was that name again? Dionysus. Okay. Why don't you call him the god of fun? <laughs> yeah, there's lots of types of fun. But yeah, Mark Antony's having a good time. He's having a good time, he's having a, a prolonged sesh. So the following <laughs> spring, uh, he moves the party to Eph Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey, and he's supposed to have entered the city in a grand procession like some extravagant, extravagant Greek king. Now this is quite important because obviously he is starting at this point to rub 
they sent it up the wrong way because he's displaying that sentence yeah properly. he's displaying <laughs> these kind of traits that they don't like kingly a bit too big for his boots kind of have caesar caesar -esque. yeah we can start to see the parallels with caesar um and on the other hand you've got octavian that is kind of Hard-working, hard -working, book-loving. Yeah, the Senate, uh, the Senate like him because they think he's more is, kind is of he, like is them. Is he well-born enough that they don't have the issue with him they had with Caesar? Yeah, he, he's, from a, he's from a fabulously wealthy and important family. What they don't like particularly, again, think of the Senate at this time. They're quite stuffy, they're quite formal, they're quite, if they had collars, they'd be stiff-collared. They'd be Jacob rees Moggs, whereas... Mark Antony is just letting his lads, lads, lads side out <laughs> and making no bones about it. So they're winding, he's winding them up. We've got to be careful though, because again, it's Plutarch and Plutarch likes to point out flaws in people's characters. And to some extent, he may be overemphasizing the actions of Mark Antony to make Octavian seem more favorable in the eyes of the studious Romans. So if we're thinking about Cleopatra again, to further fund his campaigns and the fact that he'd likely spent a little bit too much on the sesh. It was a good sesh too, though. Too many rounds of shocks there. Too much and either. Exactly. <laughs> That's Greek. No, he said he was in Greek then. He was in Greek, no, yeah. yeah. So Antony basically looks to Egypt to cure all his problems. He would have been well aware of Cleopatra. We've already said that they've already met before. He would have known kind of the wealth that was in Egypt from Caesar and a positive relationship would have been very ben beneficial for Cleopatra but also for Antony and for Rome itself. Um, Egypt's support and wealth would be really really good for him in his kind of future campaigns and to kind of get rid of any future rivals. He can buy people off. He can a buy lot of people money. off, he can, he can sink them. <laughs> he can buy a lot of mercenaries. Exactly. <laughs> So Antony sets about organising a meeting between these two and he chooses Tarsus in Turkey in 41 BC. Now we're told Mark Antony sets himself up in the centre of this town. He's trying to orchestrate this great meeting where he appears almost like a triumphal leader coming into the, si into the city. He's the dominant one. He's on a little platform so everyone can see him. They're all meant to be gathered around him going, ooh, he's really cool. Unfortunately, nothing will really prepare him for what comes next. So, we're going to read uh, Antony 26, it's written by Plutarch, which says, She received many requests both from Antony himself and from his friends calling for her to visit him, yet she treated him with such contempt and laughed at him to the extent that she sailed up the river Sidonus in a river craft covered in gold, its purple sails in the wind, its rowers pressing on with silver oars to the sound of flutes, pipes and kitharas, that's how you say it. She herself lay back beneath a canopy embroidered with gold, dressed to look like Aphrodite or Venus in some painting, while on both sides stood boys made up as cupids in paintings who fanned her. In the same way, the most beautiful of her maids in the clothes of Nereids and Graces were placed some at the rudders and others at the sail ropes. Marvellous strong smelling perfumes drifted from many burners towards the banks of the river. Some of the people escorted her on both banks of the river, right up the river from its mouth, while others came down from the city to see the site. The crowd that had gathered in the marketplace gradually moved away. Finally, only Antony himself seated on his platform remained. Everywhere there was the rumour that Aphrodite would celebrate with Dionysus for the good of Asia. Therefore, Antony sent an invitation to her for dinner, but she thought that it was better for him to come to her. So immediately wishing to show his readiness to accept and his generosity, Antony agreed and went whipped, is what I would say. <laughs> Obviously, that is not what a blue tap but... Um, what met him was a preparation that was beyond any description, but what especially amazed him was the enormous number of lights. We are told that many of these lights were hung from the roof and displayed everywhere at once. They were arranged and organised in patterns and angles to each other to form squares and circles in such a way that few sites could have been as beautiful or as worth seeing as this. She got the disco lights out for it. <laughs> Pretty fancy entrance, that then. James, Mr. P, your thoughts? Uh, she's kind of top trumped him there a little bit. 
just a little bit. I so mean, he was just on a bit of a platform. He's on a yeah. He was basically sat in a box, <laughs> 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 and she wrapped in in a golden boat with oars made of silver. And is this to impress or show him up? Is this like negging? I think it's a bit of both, personally. I, think, I mean, really, we should be asking Mr. P because. Literally, this is how you enter every classroom, <laughs> is it not? With your fabulously, yeah, yeah. fabulously, with your cherubs dancing <laughs> and smelling sweetly of incense. You see, if I could have the lights, that would be fine. That would impress me. I'll be happy with that. Just the lights. Yeah, that, and, that. and Cleopatra's. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Cleopatra and lights. It's an easy sell there. So another thing that we can say, I agree with James on this one. She really is kind of top company. She's showing her wealth, isn't she? Making a massive entrance, so me and Mr. Ridgely were saying before, this is kind of akin to maybe think about RuPaul, or maybe a rapper, <laughs> something this like is, that. This is how rappers turn up to the music awards. So she's making Anthony, I think, look and feel quite pathetic, and showing him that she has already got the upper hand. I mean, he's trying to bring his air game, isn't he? In, you know, a, a box. In a, <laughs> a box in the market. She's got a boat. At least he's got a box. <laughs> It was it at least a nice box? Well, we, we'd assume a box. But yeah, he's trying to bring his air game by trying to stand out, away from everyone and be above everyone. But yeah, no one really told him that, watch out, she's coming in a massive golden boat with a load of friends. I mean, definitely, we can certainly say she knows how to make an entrance. Yes. You're not going to miss her it's, rocking it's up. It's certainly a bit more extravagant than her entrance this season. Well, absolutely. In a <laughs> And tied to uh, Cleopatra's idea of how to make a grand entrance, we should really at this point flag up to her particularly the importance of her public image. I mean, clearly this entrance at Tarsus is not something, it's not an outfit or a, a gold boat she had lying around the house and thought, oh, well, let, <laughs> I'll go in on that gold boat today. I've not done that in a while. A public image is really, really important, partly as kind of Queen of Egypt, presentation of Egyptian rules is really, really important even with the Ptolemies. If you go further back, um, the original Egyptian pharaohs were presented as living gods, so their image was hugely important. So Cleopatra similarly has to have this kind of semi-divine, incredible image, hence why she's likening herself to Aphrodite as well. But also a public image to the Romans that she's going to visit is going to be quite important as well. She wants to portray herself in a certain way. She is a big deal. She's trying to show off her best side from all sides. And also, again, if Egypt's known for its wealth, she's going to be portraying this. So you turn up in your finest gold boat with silver oars, rather than some little shed boat you had lying around, which is probably more practical, <laughs> probably more cost efficient. But the public image is really, really important. It's a very well managed like PR campaign, isn't it? That's yeah, yeah. basically what it is. It's yeah. all, it's propaganda for herself. Absolutely, and we see this. We've seen this earlier with her presentation as her as the goddess Isis. Again, she's linked to every goddess to do with fertility, or let's just say lady parts <laughs> that she can do <laughs> for for not so subtle reasons. You know, it's not a surprise that she's tying herself to this public image but yeah it's really really well stage managed really stage crafted the next thing we should talk about are the similarities between this meeting and her meeting with caesar well how what happened when she met caesar oh it's a little bit different <laughs> it's a little bit different so long story short for mr p and anyone who has forgotten so when she first meets caesar she snuck into his palace well it's her palace but his palace into his bedroom in a sleeping bag and then in the middle of the night, as you do, and then she is revealed to him uh, in his bedroom. Classy bird. <laughs> Absolutely. So there, there are obvious massive differences. The meeting with Caesar was secretive. Um, this is the least secretive thing you could possibly imagine. I, I, I'm a bit worried it's a bit too understated. Too understated? What do you think? Silver uh, oars, not enough. Two golden boats? Two, I mean, golden, come on, Cleo. <laughs> two golden boats, purple sails. <laughs> Yeah, the, the difference is massive. The showmanship in the second one is huge. With Caesar, it's a lot more subtle. The context is also very different in that, to some extent, Caesar was a bit of an unknown when she goes to meet him. It's Rome had been in chaos. She didn't necessarily know where this venture would go in the long run. She'd previously not been as experienced in manipulating Romans, so she was probably a bit more 
careful with the first one. Again, if it all goes horribly wrong with the first meeting, mm. who's to know? Her, Caesar, and that random Sicilian who carried her, <laughs> carried in. her in. If this meeting goes wrong, everyone knows. You know? But even though the events are very different, I think what she's trying to achieve between both meetings is actually very similar. So we get through the sources, this idea that Anthony is quite vain and quite insecure. She's clearly trying to kind of look strong when she goes to meet him. And it, it's this kind of inequality and in the balance of power. So she's keeping the element of, of power with herself, isn't she? The first one, it's kind of more through surprise. And she's using a sexuality surprise. as well. <laughs> surprise! And What's then the more surprising then? Look at my golden boat. The I, mean, second, I, I would have expected a woman to emerge from a carpet. <laughs> yeah. The second one, it's it's very much about kind of her wealth and her power, but in both things, she's using what she's got at her disposal, at her disposal, to show that she is, if not better, but certainly on an even keel with the Roman that she's trying to impress. So she's still trying to keep some of that power for herself, even though she's doing it in a very different way. It's this whole kind of thing where. Caesar and Anthony probably both think that they're the ones that are in control. Anthony can't do absolutely when actually, the <laughs> she's just made. When actually that is not the case and she's the one that's in control. It's very much her as the puppet master that's kind of pulling the strings. The first one is because Caesar's old, he's thinking not with his head. So, you know. Not like Mark Anthony, he's <laughs> a well known thinker. She's using that aspect of her kind of charm to try and get what she wants and the second one it's all about kind of i know you're broke i know you need cash look i know at you how like much, the ladies look, look at how, how much cash am. i've got that you can use so she's dangling things in front of them well that's one way to put it I don't exactly. think that's in the <laughs> she, she's offering mark anthony what he wants so shed a load of cash and her laid out in the front like yeah. aphrodite without question and yeah her stagecraft in both instances is the key thing whether we believe the accuracy of this massive golden boat though you something like this the level of detail in the sources is that precise and that given that we can probably say it is m more than likely reliable this will be something that will have been written about by all contemporary sources it's not an everyday occurrence no. some woman rocking up in a massive golden boat arguably more reliable than a meeting with caesar which was meant to be done in secret like we said in the previous session, well, if you're going for a secret meeting, you always take someone to write it down, to write down what <laughs> happens, don't you, Mr. P? Yeah. Absolutely, it's a, it's a <laughs> given. But the similarities and differences and the reliability, they are quite important points. But reliability, yeah, we can probably say she would have had this wealth at her disposal. We do know she's good at stagecraft. We can probably say, arguably, yes, this is reliable. Unlike some of the bits that come next. And following on from this first meeting of Antony and Cleopatra, where we say first meeting, it's not. Plutarch then goes on to give us some idea about how this early stage of the relationship goes. And Taylor, you've got some dramatic source material for yeah. us. So the first one is Antony 27. So it says, um, Cleopatra saw in these jokes that in Antony there was a lot of the soldier and the common man. It's a bit derogatory. And used, rough. <laughs> yeah, and used this way of behaving towards him, showing confidence and no restraint. Now, she's literally laying it all out on a plate for him, isn't she? Laying herself out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or a golden boat. Or a golden plate, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so her beauty, so we are told, was not in itself outstanding. <laughs> bit, bit, bit mean. There's one for you, you to use. There you go. Not like you, Mr. Taylor. Not like <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. P. You can't Thank see you. Mr. P's face, but it is hilarious right now. <laughs> so, yeah, being with her had an inescapable hold. When talking with her, she was persuasive, and the character which surrounded her whole manner in company had a force to it. That sounds like someone that would be really, really good as a kidnapper, <laughs> doesn't it? I've not really looked into the skills you need as a kidnapper. <laughs> That's why I'm married, I kidnapped my husband. I didn't really. Um, her voice had a pleasantness of tone and her tongue, like some musical instrument with many strings, could be turned to whatever language she wished, so that in conversations with barbarians, she rarely spoke through an interpreter, mostly making her own replies on her own regardless of 
whether they were, and he goes on to list a whole range of different people from different areas. And then um, 28, certain parts of that which are quite useful. So it starts off saying, in this way, Cleopatra so completely took hold of Antony. And then it moves on and it says, he let himself be carried off by her to Alexandria. No, not, not physically. <laughs> not literally, no. Not literally, come with me. Ben, bench me pressing. Um, there like a young man with, with time on his hands for leisure, he wasted his time spending it upon amusements and pleasures. Time which it's another nice way to describe Cleopatra. <laughs> yeah, time which Antiphon calls the most expensive of all goods. Mm -hmm. So he's just living yeah. his best life in he Alexandria. Is, according to Plutarch, he's definitely living his best life. Now looking at Plutarch's description of this early honeymoon period of this relationship, you can argue that this is Plutarch definitely being his sassiest. What he constantly makes the point, he makes Antony the butt of all his jokes. Antony's meant to, he's a proper homer. He's a simplistic, straightforward, <laughs> do what you tell him. He's the guy guarding the bee in the jar. Oh. God love that episode. Yeah, um, and Plutarch definitely makes fun of him. He called, t picks up on his soldier's tendencies. That he's not too sharp, he's quite blunt, and he's easily wound around Cleopatra's little finger. Now this is more likely to fit into Plutarch's character arc style, he's a biographer particularly, um, where he likes to write about great men who achieve great things but ultimately have a fundamental flaw or a weakness. And in Mark Antony's case, his fundamental flaw and weakness is Cleopatra, hence that line about she was able to control him so completely. Yeah. You know, he's, it's not even like he's trying to fend her off, he's just sucked straight in. Besotted. He's so. completely besotted, he's fallen over his own tongue, dragging round after her. Um, so he's definitely niggling Mark Antony, again he describes him like a young man with time and leisure. I mean, let's not forget, Mark Antony is meeting Cleopatra to get money to go and fight the Parthians. He's not really fighting the Parthians at this point, is <laughs> no. he? He's no. Very similar to Caesar, they turn up, they meet Cleopatra, they spend the next, in this case the entire winter, having a nice time. It's almost like they completely forget anything they were meant to be doing or what they should be doing once they come across this fabulous, apparently not very attractive woman. And this is, like picking up on that, there's this idea that we get with Caesar as well, that they are very much thinking of themselves and they are not thinking about Rome, which is what they should be doing. Which oh, is because obviously of that evil yeah, woman. Not good. So they're both seen as being weak, they're being controlled by a woman, which to the Romans is completely shameful because women are second class citizens. So and they don't to like Plutarch, that. To be fair, he yeah. was a bit of a an unpleasant chap in that sense. <laughs> so it's this idea that Cleopatra is giving them what they want to be able to keep them on side so it's a method of control we need to think about why is he writing this so is he writing it basically to kind of justify the end that Anthony gets so making him look really bad to say that, yeah he deserved weakness. yeah he deserved to to die basically um is but he blaming Cleopatra for Anthony's behavior and saying absolutely. it's her fault um yeah she's corrupted him in some she's way definitely yeah corrupted. or is it that he just doesn't like, like Anthony Oh, but yeah, it could be anything really. But to be fair to Plutarch, a lot of the, the original source material, the primary sources he will have looked at, it'll be really hard for him to get a good balanced view of Mark Antony and particularly Cleopatra because yeah. all, all the sources he will have looked at will have been pro-Augustan, they'll have been written after Octavian wins, they will be the likes of Horace and Virgil, um, these people who have fundamentally used to prop up this Augustan regime that comes next. They're Octavian's propagandists. Yeah. Yeah, and you're never going to get them going, oh, well, actually, they were reasonably good guys. <laughs> so it's going to be difficult for Plutarch, which is why, unlike Plutarch, who's meant to be a very well-researched, well-read historian, biographer, he throws in quite a random bit of a source. Rather than citing a, a credible source, he throws in some guy that his granddad knew. What's yeah. the actual... So if you if you look at the source, it says that it was a doctor who used to tell Plutarch's granddad that when he was in Alexandria, he knew one of the Queen's cooks. <laughs> so there we go. Right. Yeah, so my, my mate's my mate's brother's 
girlfriend's milkman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a vague and not really. It's literally like asking Karen on Facebook what she <laughs> thinks. Um, I do that frequently. Well, we know. And, well, where's that got? Where's that got? You know. Mr. Shouldn't Pete? always follow her advice. <laughs> no. That's all I'm gonna say. Just because Karen said it doesn't mean it's true. I know you're saying like these sources are very anti Cleopatra, but I'm taking from this she's able to kind of turn any situation to her advantage, isn't she? Yeah. Like, to some extent. With, with CZ kind of said she's a bit of a gold digger after the rich man, where Anthony here, she's also most taken like a cougar stance. Like, <laughs> she's the wealthy one trying to seduce yeah. her. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. She's the oil billionaire. Yeah, yeah. She's the 20-year-old yeah. model. And yeah. um, she can flip things to her, to her advantage, definitely. But saying that, she's nowhere near as skilled as in the hustle as Octavian. Right, okay. So this is why. When he, when he emerges victorious, he doesn't just win emphatically he wins according to history as well yeah. and he makes sure that history shows him in a good light and for him to be in a good light they need they've to got to be in the bad light i told you that he was the best one to go for well you've uh, what source have you been reading this <laughs> <laughs> Not Reg, Reg yesterday all the way <laughs> which is his funerary relation to himself <laughs> thank you so there we go the early stages of cleopatra's relationship with mark antony does it sound like it's going to end well yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've already told you it does. <laughs> so there you go, the meeting of Anthony and Cleopatra. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our fabulous guests, James the Science Toolboy. Yeah, bye. And Mr. P. Bye bye. Uh, leave us a comment below. As always, thank you for listening. We hope this has been useful. And until next time. Bye. Bye. We're just going to go and unravel Mr. Yes. P so that we can use some of his toilet roll because well, we've all run out. Because we know where it all went. <laughs> this is where I'm going to run off now. You can try, but we've tied your toilet roll to the chair. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>